In our lecture for the week two, we're going to discuss the fundamental properties of water and basic classes and features of organic molecules. As we mentioned in the lecture last week, in the water molecule, the electron density is shifted towards oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, which means that the bond between oxygen and hydrogen in a water molecule is highly polar, resulting in slightly positive charge on the hydrogen atom and slightly negative charge on the oxygen atom. You can see it on the illustration, slightly negative charge on the red sphere representing oxygen and slightly positive charge on the blue sphere representing hydrogen. So not only the covalent bonds in the water molecule are polar, negatively charged oxygen of one molecule and, and positively charged hydrogen of another molecule form a hydrogen bond. The polarity of the water molecules results in the attraction of those molecules to other polar substances as well as ions. For example, water is attracted to cellulose or proteins. Such polar substances or ionic substances that readily interact with water or dissolve in water are called hydrophilic. Examples of hydrophilic molecules include proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, various salts or alcohols. On the other hand, nonpolar molecules, such as oils, don't interact with water well and called hydrophobic. So examples of hydrophobic molecules would be fats, oils, waxes, sterols, and a variety of hydrocarbons, such as gasoline. Water as pretty much Every other compound can exist in three physical states, liquid, gas, and solid. So in the liquid water, hydrogen bonds constantly form and break because of the movement of water molecules. When water is heated, water molecules move faster hydrogen bonds completely break and water evaporates. When temperature of water decreases, eventually hydrogen bonds will contribute to the maintenance of its crystalline structure and the ice is formed. Uh, you probably have heard that ice is less dense than liquid water. So ice floats on the surface of the water. The reason for that is that water molecules are pushed farther apart than in the water molecule due to the um, not due to the hydrogen bonds not breaking being uh, permanent. Uh, this feature of the solid state being less dense than the liquid state is quite unique for water and the formation of the liquid water results in the ice floating on the surface of bodies of water such as lakes and rivers and that ice interestingly enough protects plants and animals that dwell in water from freezing okay now another important feature is that when water freezes obviously it forms ice and if water freezes within the cell and remember cells are approximately 60 percent water when water in the cell freezes it expands and can break the membranes of the cell. Therefore, in most cases, cells cannot survive freezing without a specific um, measures. Another important feature of water is high specific heat capacity. So what is heat capacity in the first place? So heat capacity is the amount of heat that is needed to increase the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. 
Among known liquids, water has the highest specific heat capacity, one calorie or 4.18 joules per gram uh, per degree Celsius. And this is due to the formation of hydrogen bonds. In order to break hydrogen bonds, one needs to apply a lot of heat. Since there are many hydrogen bonds, the heat that needs to be applied to increase the temperature of water by one degree Celsius uh, is enormous. Since water has very high heat capacity, it takes a lot of time for water to heat and a lot of time for it to cool. For instance, land cools much faster than the sea, and you can notice it if you go to, say, Florida, or even shores of Lake Erie. The uh, water in the lake will be way above freezing, while, you know, it can be in October and still, you know, there can be some freezes on the land. That high heat capacity of water is critical for the existence of warm-blooded animals because um, it allows warm-blooded animals to disperse heat more evenly to maintain a stable body temperature um, when the temperature of the environment changes. Another important parameter of water is heat of vaporization, amount of energy that is needed to change one gram of um, liquid water or any liquid into gas. In order to evaporate, hydrogen bonds uh, have to be broken. And that requires a lot of energy. Which means when water evaporates, the energy is taken up. And the environment cools down. So essentially, evaporation of water, such as sweat, requires the absorption of the heat from the surrounding, for instance, from the animal body. And the sweat evaporation as a result will cool down the animal body. Water is often considered to be a universal solvent, which is not entirely true because it cannot dissolve hydrophobic molecules. But since water is polar, a lot of ions and polar molecules can be dissolved in it. Water serves in this case as a solvent uh, capable of dissolving uh, polar molecules, polar compounds, and the ionic compounds. When dissolved, polar molecules or ions form hydrogen bonds with water molecule. Uh, surrounding with water, it's called hydration or solvation. For example, ionic compounds, as it is demonstrated on the picture to the right, such as sodium chloride, uh, interact with individual um, water molecules. And you can see that these ionic compounds dissociate in water. Individual ions, such as chloride ion and sodium ion, interact with water molecules. Energetically, this interaction is preferable compared to sodium chloride remaining, you know, it's in crystal form, and this solvated or hydrated uh, cations and anions now exist in the solution. So, if you look at the illustration to the right, you can see that chloride anion interacts with partially positive hydrogen atoms of water molecules, while sodium cation interacts with partially negative oxygen atoms of water. Since most biological molecules are hydrophilic, we call water a universal solvent, but again, we have to keep in mind that water can dissolve uh, polar molecules or ions. Now, water possesses that interesting feature called cohesion and adhesion. So, cohesion is the feature of water in which water molecules are attracted to each other due to hydrogen bonding. And they keep molecules together at the interface between the water and the air. Cohesion contributes to a surface tension, the resistance of water to external forces because of the hydrogen bonds. 
In other words, water withstands that disruption uh, exerted by you know external forces exerted by tension um, due to the hydrogen bonds. So cohesion and surface tension keep the hydrogen bonds of the water molecules intact. Now, for instance, example of surface tension will be when you place the needle on the surface of the water, it's going to float because the surface tension maintains um, the, the uninterrupted surface. Adhesion is a different feature of water. It's an attraction between water and other molecules, obviously hydrophilic molecules. It can be stronger than the cohesion. Adhesion and cohesion together contribute to capillary action. For instance, water molecules are attracted to the um, charged walls of the capillaries more than to each other. So they will move up the capillary tube and cohesion will uh, pull the water molecules um, kind of upwards. So in this capillary action, adhesion essentially allows water to stick to a surface while cohesion pulls the re remaining water molecules up. This feature, uh, capillary action, that depends entirely on cohesion and adhesion is important for the transport of water from the roots of a plant to the leaves of the plant. Now, uh, when certain substances are dissolved in water, they can form acids and bases. We're going to talk about two types of acids and bases, Arrhenius and Bronsted Lowry. So Arrhenius acid is a compound that, when dissolved in water, yields hydronium cations shown here. Arrhenius base is a compound that, when dissolved in water, yields hydroxide anions. This is a rather um, narrow classification of acids and bases. Bronsted and Lowry proposed a um, slightly more expansive definition of acids and bases. According to Bronsted Lowry, an acid is a compound that donates a proton to another compound. For instance, here in this example, um, water is an acid which donates hydrogen to, um, in this example, sorry, water is an acid that donates a hydrogen to the base, the ammonia. Base is then a compound that accepts a proton. So in this example, water is an acid, ammonia is the base. When water loses the hydrogen, it becomes a conjugate base, OH minus, can easily accept a proton and be a bronsted lowry base. Conjugate acid, the ammonium cation, can donate hydrogen and serve as the bronsted lowry acid. So the graph on the left represents the acidity of different um, you know, commonly found substances, mixtures in the environment. We're not going to go over all of them. Uh, my goal here is to introduce the concept of pH. So the greater the concentration of hydronium cations, the greater the acidity. pH is the negative logarithm of the concentration of hydronium cations. In other words, the concentration of hydronium cations equals 10 in the negative power of pH. POH similarly is the negative logarithm of the concentration of hydroxide anions and the concentration of hydroxide anions in the solution can be calculated as 10 in the power of negative pH. These two parameters are mutually dependent and you must know that the sum of pH and POH at 25 degrees Celsius and um, atmospheric pressure is always 14. So you can see, for instance, in the gastric juice 
well, let's take lime juice, the pH is 2, pOH is 12. In the household ammonia, the pH is 12 and the pOH is 2. The greater the pH, the less acidic and more alkaline the compound is. The lower the pH, the more acidic and less alkaline the compound is. Now, in biological systems, pH, or pOH, should be maintained relatively stable. In order to maintain um, the pH in the biological systems, uh, there are so-called buffers. Buffers are the solutions that can readily absorb excess hydrogen or hydronium, cation or hydroxide and ion, thereby maintaining pH in the narrow range. Buffers are essential for the survival since they can maintain constant pH in the cellular fluid, blood, and extracellular fluids. There are three main buffer systems in biological, uh, three main biological buffer systems. Bicarbonate buffer system, which buffers blood, extracellular fluid, and oceans. In this system, uh, Carbonic acid dissociates into water and carbon dioxide, or it can dissociate into hydrogen and HCO3 minus. So, what happens when you add acid or base? When you add acid, it interacts with bicarbonate, forming H2CO3. When you add base, it interacts with H2CO3 forming water and bicarbonate anion. Protein buffer system is essential for buffering intracellular fluid in the blood as well. So the NH2 or amino groups can absorb hydrogen in case if acid is added forming NH3 plus if pH rises OH minus hydroxide anion is added and hydrogen is required hydrogen can be donated by the carboxyl group COOH so we can write it down this way if Hydrogen needs to be absorbed. It is absorbed by amino group if OH minus has to be absorbed. It is absorbed by the carboxyl group, carboxyl amino. Finally, phosphate buffer system, which is essential for stabilizing the pH of urine and pH in the intracellular fluid. In this case, hydrophosphate anion, uh, there is a, something should be corrected here. So it's two minus, and this is minus, this is minus, and this is two minus. So hydrophosphate anion can absorb hydrogen resulting in D-hydrophosphate in ion. And D-hydrophosphate in ion can donate one of the hydrogens to form water, producing hydrophosphate in ion. Now we're going to talk about organic compounds. So what are organic compounds essentially? All organic molecules contain carbon atoms. This carbon atoms form four covalent bonds to other atoms, such as hydrogen, or oxygen, or sulfur, or nitrogen. And single bonds in organic compounds must be arranged in the tetrahedral geometry. For instance, the simplest organic compound, methane, represents the tetrahedral arrangement here. 
Um, I want to highlight that this rule, the tetrahedral geometry, can be applied only to the organic compounds in which single bonds are formed. Now, um, all organic compounds contain carbon. Not all compounds that contain carbon are organic. For instance, cyanide, carbon dioxide are not considered to be organic. Probably the simplest type of organic molecules are hydrocarbons. They consist of carbon and hydrogen atoms, methane, ethane, both represent tetrahedral geometry, ethene, you can see that in case of ethene, since there is a double bond, the molecule does not have tetrahedral geometry, it has a planar geometry. Um, hydrocarbons can exist in different shapes, from linear to carbon rings, such as cyclohexane, combination of both. And the bonds between carbons can be single, double, or even triple covalent. That will very much affect the geometry of the uh, organic molecule. The molecules, which consist of linear chains or rings with mostly single bonds, are called aliphatic. Rings with alternating single and double bonds, such as benzene, are considered to be aromatic. You can look at this molecule here, the molecule of pyridine, and you may notice that it contains, instead of one of the carbons, an atom of nitrogen. So, what would it be? Is it still aromatic? Yes, because there are alternating single and double bonds. But when one of the carbons is replaced by an atom of a different element, for instance, nitrogen, we call such molecules heterocyclic aromatic compounds. A very important feature of organic molecules is that they can form isomers. Isomers are the molecules that have the same chemical formula, but the positions of atoms and or chemical bonds in those molecules are different. So there are several types of isomers. First type that we must mention are structural isomers. In structural isomers, the placement of covalent bonds is different. So, for instance, butane and isobutane, you can see that the placement of carbon-carbon bonds is different, linear on the left and T-shaped on the right. In geometric isomers, the placement of covalent bonds is very similar, but orientation of these bonds can be different. So, for instance, uh, in this molecule of butene, two carbons separated by a double bond are placed on the same side of the double bond, we can say the bottom. Okay, When carbons are on the same side of the double bond, we call it the cis configuration. When carbons are located on opposite sides of the double bonds, we call it a trans configuration. Cis and trans orientation of carbons play a critical role in um, physical properties of biological membranes, for example. You can see that aleatic acid, shown here on top, has um, trans configuration of the double bond, and therefore linear. Oleic acid has cis configuration of the double bonds and therefore kinked. These linear molecules will stack tighter than the bent ones and will produce denser and more um, less fluid um, layer of fat compared to the oleic acid. Now, a couple of last things. First of all, enantiomers. It's also a type of an isomer. It's a molecule 
molecules. They share same chemical structure, same chemical bonds, but three-dimensional placement of atoms is different. These molecules are not superimposable mirror images. For instance, left and dexter or D isomer, um, you can see that the placement of atoms is different in a way that if we place a hypothetical mirror here, these two molecules are the mirror reflections of each other. This is another example of L and D isomers of uh, fluorochlorobromomethane. Um, why this is important? So these enantiomers have different biological um, functions and for instance amino acids that form proteins are L isomers glucose that forms starch is a D isomer of glucose um, some enzymes can only work with L amino acids or D sugars the last thing that we need to mention about organic compounds is that they can contain not only carbon and hydrogen but also a variety of functional groups. These functional groups in organic molecules confer them specific chemical properties. Functional groups are attached to the carbon backbone um, and rings, chains, they can be at one place, they can be several groups at different places, and the set of functional groups in biological molecules determine the chemical properties and the function of those biological molecules in the living organisms. These groups can be hydrophobic, such as methyl group. They can be hydrophilic, such as hydroxyl group, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, phosphate, and thiol, or sulfhydryl. And importantly, the functional groups can form hydrogen bonds between each other. For example, carbonyl group in thymine and amino group in adenine can form a hydrogen bond. Carbonyl group in cytosine and amino group in guanine can form a hydrogen bond. We're going to see more illustrations of the importance of these functional groups when we're going to discuss biological macromolecules next week.